It was one of those nights where boredom had us all on edge. We'd been driving around town for hours, the glow of the streetlights and the occasional flicker of neon signs washing over us as we circled the same empty streets. The four of us, Jenny, Luca, Kylie, and I sat in silence, tired of talking about the usual stuff, the monotony of school and weekend plans that never materialized. There was something eerie about the quiet streets that night. The way the darkness seemed to cling to the edges of the road, stretching shadows longer than they should have been. I've got an idea, Jenny said suddenly from the front seat, breaking the silence. Her voice had that mischievous edge, the kind that always meant trouble. You guys remember that old house on Pinecrest? The one everyone says is haunted? Kylie groaned from the back seat. You mean the haunted house that's just some abandoned construction project? That's lame, Jenny. Jenny turned her head slightly, her grin catching the light from the dashboard. It's still creepy, right? Come on, we've got nothing better to do. Let's check it out. I should have said something then. Maybe pointed out that breaking into an old, unfinished house at midnight wasn't exactly a bright idea. But boredom does weird things to your sense of judgment. So I found myself nodding along with Luca, who was all for it. Before long, we were cruising down Pinecrest Avenue, a part of town that had fallen into disrepair long before we ever knew it. The streets were lined with houses that looked like they hadn't been touched in years, windows boarded up, weeds growing wild in the yards. And then, there it was, looming at the end of the cul-de-sac like a dark shadow, the two-story skeleton of a house. Its unfinished frame stood stark against the moonlit sky, like a silent monument to someone's forgotten dream. Jenny pulled the car to a stop a little too eagerly, and we all piled out. The wind was picking up, rustling the overgrown grass and the broken branches that littered the sidewalk. The house seemed to breathe with the wind, its half-built walls groaning and creaking, as if it were alive. Well, how do we get in? Luca asked, his eyes scanning the front door, which was bolted shut with a heavy chain. Jenny, of course, had an answer for everything. There's a window around the side, she said, already heading toward it. I'll climb through and open the back door. Kylie and I exchanged glances, but we followed. Jenny was quick. She slid through the broken window with ease, disappearing into the shadows of the house. A moment later, the creak of the back door opening echoed through the silence. The smell hit me as soon as I stepped inside. It was thick and heavy, a combination of damp wood, mold, and something sharper, like the stench of ammonia, maybe cat urine, I thought, though it was hard to tell. The first floor was nearly finished, with walls painted a pale, peeling white, and the wooden floors creaking under our weight. Dust hung in the air like a fine mist, swirling in the beams of our phone flashlights. All right, let's split up, Jenny said, already moving toward the kitchen. More fun that way. I wasn't exactly thrilled about wandering around alone, but I didn't want to seem like the scared one. Luca headed toward the living room with Kylie, while I decided to check out the upstairs. The stairs creaked with every step as I made my way to the second floor. It was immediately clear that this part of the house was far from finished. The walls were just wooden frames, the beams exposed, and the ceiling above was nothing but black emptiness. My flashlight danced across the open space, revealing nails and tools scattered around, but no sign of anyone having worked here in years. The air up here was colder, and there was something about the emptiness that made me uneasy. I decided I'd seen enough of the second floor, so I turned back toward the stairs, my footsteps echoing in the hollow house. But something caught my eye, a narrow door at the end of the hallway, half hidden in the shadows. Curiosity got the better of me, and I made my way toward it, the cold air biting at my skin. The basement. I don't know why, but my hand shook as I reached for the door handle. It felt wrong, like I shouldn't be opening it, but I did. The hinges squealed as the door swung open, revealing a set of steep stairs descending into the darkness below. I hesitated, my flashlight cutting through the black void, but after a moment, I steeled myself and stepped down. The basement was small, unfinished like the rest of the house. The concrete floor was rough underfoot, and the walls were bare. In the corner of the room, I spotted an old, wooden table with a single chair. 
On the table, as though carefully placed, was a worn leather-bound Bible, its cover dark with age. Something about it seemed out of place, like it didn't belong here in this abandoned, half-built house. I stepped closer, reaching out to touch the book when I noticed her. A figure, sitting in the far corner of the basement, her back against the wall. She was completely still, her hair long and matted, covering most of her face. My breath caught in my throat. Hey, are you okay? I managed to whisper, my voice barely audible in the stillness. She didn't respond. She didn't move. I felt my heart race, the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. My mind raced with questions. Who was she? What was she doing down here? Suddenly, from upstairs, I heard a scream, a piercing, terrified scream that broke the silence of the house like a clap of thunder. It was Kylie. Without thinking, I turned and bolted up the stairs, nearly tripping over my own feet as I ran. The basement door slammed behind me with a deafening thud as I raced down the hallway. Luca! What the hell's going on? I shouted, my voice cracking with fear. But there was no answer, just the sound of footsteps pounding down the stairs, the house groaning with the sudden weight of panic. Jenny was at the front door, already pulling it open. Get to the car! Now! She screamed. I didn't need to be told twice. The four of us scrambled out of the house, the cool night air hitting me like a slap in the face. We tumbled into the car, breathless and shaking, slamming the doors behind us. What happened? I gasped, looking around at their wide-eyed faces. But no one spoke right away. They just stared at the house, their faces pale, as if they'd seen something worse than I had downstairs. The car was dead silent for a good few minutes, the only sound being our heavy breathing. I could feel the thudding of my own heart in my ears, the panic still gripping me tight. Jenny was gripping the steering wheel so hard her knuckles were white, but she hadn't started the car yet. None of us had the courage to move or speak, like we were still trying to understand what had just happened. Finally, Luca broke the silence. There were people, he said, his voice barely a whisper. Two men, just standing there. Jenny turned to him, her eyes wide. What do you mean, people? There's no one living in that place. It's abandoned. Lucas shook his head, his gaze distant. I don't know who they were. But they were in one of the rooms, just staring at us. I don't think they even blinked. Kylie, who had been hugging her knees to her chest in the back seat, finally spoke up. Her voice was trembling and she didn't look up as she spoke. I saw them too. I thought. I thought maybe they were homeless or something. But there was something wrong with them. They were just wrong. I swallowed hard, trying to make sense of it all. A chill ran through me as I remembered the woman I'd seen in the basement. The way she just sat there, motionless, like she wasn't even real. I saw someone too. I said quietly, my voice sounding strange to my own ears. Everyone turned to look at me. Down in the basement. There was this woman. She was sitting in the corner, not moving. She didn't say anything, didn't even look at me. I don't know what the hell she was doing down there. Jenny stared at me, her face paling even more than before. A woman? Are you sure? I nodded. Yeah. Long hair, kind of a mess. She didn't move at all like she didn't even know I was there. For a moment, no one said anything. The weight of what we had experienced was settling in, thick and heavy like the air inside that house. It didn't make any sense. None of it did. People didn't just live in abandoned houses, sitting in corners like ghosts. And there was no explanation for why they hadn't said anything, why they hadn't even reacted when we showed up. Finally, Jenny reached for the keys and shoved them into the ignition. Screw this, she muttered, her voice shaking. We're leaving. The engine roared to life, and the tires screeched as we sped down the empty street, the house shrinking into the distance behind us. But even as we left it behind, the unease lingered. There was something about that place that felt unfinished, like it had gripped us and wouldn't let go. As we drove, Kylie spoke again, her voice soft but strained. When we went into that room, there was something on the floor. 
Luca glanced at her, his brow furrowed. What do you mean? She hesitated, her eyes wide as if she were still trying to convince herself of what she'd seen. It was. I don't know, Dark. Like, there were these dark shapes all over the floor. At first, I thought it was just trash, but then I realized they were moving. A cold chill ran down my spine. Moving? What do you mean, moving? Kylie shook her head, pressing her hands to her temples like she was trying to block out the memory. I don't know. They looked like shadows, but not like normal shadows. They had shape form. I swear I saw one of them crawl across the floor. Shadows don't crawl. Luca muttered, rubbing the back of his neck, but his voice lacked the usual bravado. I know what I saw, Luca. Kylie snapped, her voice cracking. I didn't imagine it. Those things, whatever they were, they were moving. They were alive. The tension in the car was suffocating. None of us knew what to make of Kylie's story, but something about it nodded at me. Shadows that moved? It sounded insane, but then again, nothing about that house had made any sense. I'd seen a woman in the basement who shouldn't have been there. Luca and Kylie had seen two men standing in an empty room. It was like the whole house was... off. Suddenly, Jenny slammed on the brakes, the car screeching to a halt in the middle of the deserted road. What the hell? Luca shouted, bracing himself against the dashboard. Jenny was staring straight ahead, her face pale and her hands trembling on the steering wheel. Look, she whispered, her voice barely audible. I followed her gaze and felt my blood run cold. Standing in the middle of the road, just a few yards ahead of us, was the woman from the basement. She was exactly as I'd seen her, her hair long and tangled, her clothes dirty and torn, like she'd been sitting in that basement for years. But now she was standing, her face turned toward us, though her eyes were still hidden beneath the mess of her hair. My heart hammered in my chest as I realized that there was no way she could have gotten here. No way she could have left that basement and appeared in front of us. We sat there in stunned silence, staring at her, unable to move or speak. And then, slowly, she lifted her head. Her hair parted just enough to reveal her face, pale, gaunt, and expressionless. Her eyes were dark, hollow, and fixed on us with a look that sent a bolt of fear straight through me. She's not real, I whispered, more to myself than anyone else. She can't be real, but she was. She was standing right there, staring at us like we were the intruders, like we had no business being in her world. Jenny's hands trembled as she gripped the wheel, her foot hovering over the gas pedal. We need to go, she muttered, her voice shaking. Now, before any of us could react, the woman took a step forward. Just one step, but it was enough to snap us out of our paralysis. Jenny slammed on the gas, and the car lurched forward, speeding past her. As we drove, I dared to look back, expecting her to still be standing there, watching us. But she wasn't. She was gone, vanished into the night like she had never been there. The drive back to town was a blur. None of us spoke. None of us wanted to. When we finally pulled into the parking lot of a gas station on the edge of town, Jenny shut off the engine and leaned back in her seat, letting out a shaky breath. I'm never going back there, she said firmly, her voice low but resolute. None of us are. Luca and Kylie both nodded in silent agreement, and I found myself doing the same. Whatever we had seen in that house, those people, those shadows, it wasn't something we could explain. It wasn't something we wanted to understand. As I sat there in the quiet car, the memory of the woman's dark, hollow eyes burned into my mind. I knew one thing for sure. We had stepped into something that night. Something we weren't supposed to. And whatever it was, it had seen us too. It all started one quiet summer evening in the sleepy suburban town we called home. My name is Josh, and ever since I can remember, I've been best friends with Sam. We were the kind of duo that stuck together through everything, constantly looking for ways to stir up trouble. The town was small, the kind of place where everyone knew each other, 
and there wasn't much excitement aside from the occasional high school party or the local fair. Sam and I, though, we craved something more, something that would break the monotony. It was a night like any other. We had plans to meet up with a couple of girls from school, but those plans quickly fell apart when they canceled last minute. Left with nothing to do, we found ourselves wandering the empty streets, the only sound being the occasional rustle of leaves as the wind swept through. The air was thick and warm, typical of a summer night, but there was something else in the atmosphere that felt different. I didn't know it at the time, but it was a feeling I would later come to regret ignoring. So what now? Sam asked, kicking a stone along the sidewalk as we passed through our familiar neighborhood. He had this glint in his eyes, the kind that signaled he was about to suggest something reckless. And sure enough, he did. How about we hit the old mansion near the cemetery? You know, the one we checked out last summer? Sam grinned. I knew exactly which place he was talking about. The old mansion. It was a decrepit, hulking structure that had been abandoned for years, sitting on the outskirts of town near the cemetery. The house had a reputation. Some said it was haunted, others said it was cursed, and we had already visited it once out of curiosity. That time, we only stayed on the ground floor, throwing rocks and laughing at how the place looked like it had been forgotten by time itself. We hadn't dared venture further than that. You're crazy. I laughed, but the idea quickly took root in my mind. What else did we have to do? The thought of breaking into that place again sounded better than going home and calling it a night. Twenty minutes later, we found ourselves standing in front of the mansion's rusted iron gate. The place looked even more rundown than I remembered, with ivy crawling up its cracked walls and windows shattered from years of neglect. It was a house that seemed to exhale darkness. The nearby cemetery loomed in the background, the gravestones barely visible in the moonlight. Sam pulled out his flashlight, flicking it on and off like a switchblade. Ready? He asked. Born ready, I replied, though there was a slight tremor in my voice I hoped he didn't notice. We pushed open the gate, which groaned in protest as if warning us to stay away. The overgrown lawn crunched beneath our feet as we made our way toward the front door. It was locked, just like last time, but Sam wasn't phased. He walked over to one of the broken windows on the side of the house, the same one we'd climbed through before. I followed closely behind. As soon as we were inside, the familiar scent of mildew and decay hit me. The place was a wreck, peeling wallpaper, sagging floorboards, and dust everywhere. It looked like no one had set foot inside in years, maybe decades. We started our usual routine, chucking small rocks and debris at the walls and shattered windows. It was childish, sure, but we found it entertaining. Sam, being Sam, took it a step further. He picked up a large rock and hurled it at one of the attic windows. The crash echoed through the empty halls, louder than any of us had expected. We both froze, waiting for the sound to fade. But something was wrong. I don't know how else to describe it, but the air around us seemed to change. There was this oppressive silence, like the house itself was holding its breath. Then, before I could say anything, the rock Sam had thrown came back landing with a dull thud right at our feet. What the hell? I muttered, my heart beginning to race. Sam looked just as shocked as I was. That's not possible. He whispered, glancing up at the attic window. There was no one there. You think someone's messing with us? I asked, though I didn't believe it myself. Only one way to find out. Sam said, his voice a little too casual for comfort. He picked up the rock again and motioned toward the staircase leading to the second floor. The attic had always been off limits for us. We never had the guts to explore it before. Are you seriously suggesting we go up there? I asked, but I already knew the answer. We climbed the creaky wooden stairs, our footsteps echoing through the desolate house. Each step felt heavier than the last, as if the house itself was trying to slow us down. The second floor was worse than the ground level with broken furniture strewn about and walls covered in strange, indecipherable graffiti. But we didn't stop. We made our way up a second staircase, this one leading to the attic. As soon as we reached the top, I knew we had made a mistake. The attic was small, 
much smaller than I had expected. The ceiling sloped low, and the air was thick with the stench of rot. There, in the center of the floor, was a pentagram drawn in red. Around it were several candles, long extinguished but still standing upright, as if they had been used recently. The room had an unsettling, unnatural feel to it, like it had been waiting for us. And then there was the smell. It hit us like a wall, the rancid, unmistakable stench of something decaying. My eyes darted to the corner of the room, where a large, old wardrobe stood. The door was slightly ajar, and whatever was inside was the source of that nauseating smell. We should leave, I said, my voice barely more than a whisper. Sam didn't argue. For once, he seemed just as scared as I was. We turned to head back down the stairs when we heard it, footsteps. But not from the attic. They were coming from the floor below us, slow and deliberate, like someone was moving through the house, searching for something, or someone. I looked at Sam, and his face had gone pale. We're not alone, he whispered. We stood frozen, our ears straining to catch any sound. Then, from below, came a voice. It was faint, almost like a whisper, but unmistakable. They're upstairs. My blood ran cold. This wasn't a game anymore. We needed to get out fast. Without thinking, I rushed toward the nearest window, my heart pounding in my chest. But before we could move, we heard something else, the unmistakable creak of someone climbing the stairs. The sound of footsteps growing louder made every hair on the back of my neck stand on end. I looked at Sam, and his wide eyes mirrored the panic I felt deep in my gut. Whoever was down there wasn't just walking around. They were coming for us. Out the window! I whispered urgently my voice barely audible over the steady creak of the stairs beneath the weight of those approaching. Sam snapped out of his frozen state and nodded. We scrambled toward the nearest window, one that was already cracked open just enough for us to slip through. It was a small attic window, barely wide enough to squeeze through, but I didn't care. My hands fumbled with the glass, and just as I was about to lift it higher, the footsteps stopped. Dead silence. For a second, I thought maybe whoever it was had given up, but then, a voice. You can't leave. It whispered, soft but with a strange intensity that made my stomach churn. It didn't sound like a man or a woman, just something not entirely human. I felt Sam's hand grip my shoulder. Go now! He hissed. I shoved the window open as wide as it would go and threw one leg over the ledge, quickly followed by the other. The cold night air hit me like a slap to the face, sharp and biting despite the summer warmth that lingered. My feet landed with a crunch on the old shingles of the roof, and I glanced down, seeing just how far the drop was. We were three stories up, too high to jump safely. Sam was right behind me, moving quicker than I had ever seen him move. He hauled himself out of the window, and just as he did, I heard the slow creak of the attic door opening behind us. I didn't turn to look. I couldn't. We started moving across the sloped roof, trying to keep low and stay balanced. The shingles beneath our feet felt brittle, like they might give way at any second. My heart was pounding so hard I could hear it in my ears, drowning out everything but the adrenaline-fueled thump, thump, thump. Sam led the way, moving with a speed and agility I didn't think he was capable of. But we were both running on pure fear now. We needed to get down, and fast. There! Sam pointed toward the back of the house, where the roof sloped down toward a lower section, a porch roof, maybe eight or nine feet from the ground. We could make the jump. It wouldn't be graceful, but it was better than staying up here and waiting for whatever was inside the house to catch up. Without another word, Sam made the leap. He landed hard but got to his feet quickly, wincing as he grabbed his ankle. I followed, my heart in my throat, and jumped down. The impact rattled my bones, but I didn't care. I was on the ground. We both were. Now we just had to get away. The cemetery loomed just beyond the backyard of the mansion, and we instinctively made a beeline for it. It was stupid, I know. Running toward a cemetery in the dead of night after what we had just witnessed, but it was the only place we knew we could hide. As we sprinted across the open field between the house and the graveyard, 
I glanced back over my shoulder. The house sat in eerie stillness, its windows dark and lifeless, but there was movement, shadowy figures emerging from the front door. My breath caught in my throat as I realized it wasn't just one or two people. There were four, maybe five figures, all wearing long, dark cloaks that flowed behind them like liquid shadows. Their faces were hidden, but I could feel their eyes on us, even from this distance. Sam, run! I shouted, my voice barely carrying over the wind that had started to pick up. We reached the cemetery gates, pushing through the rusted iron bars and ducking behind the nearest headstone. I crouched low, my breathing ragged and uneven. Sam was beside me, his chest heaving as he tried to catch his breath. What? What the hell was that? Sam gasped, his voice trembling. I don't know, I whispered, peeking over the edge of the tombstone. But I think we walked in on something we shouldn't have. The figures were circling the house now, their cloaks swirling in the wind like some kind of ritual. They moved with purpose, their heads turning in unison as if they were searching for us. They know we're here. I muttered, my pulse racing. Sam's eyes were wide with fear. What do we do? We can't stay here. I looked around, trying to make sense of our options. The cemetery was huge but it didn't offer much in the way of cover. Just rows and rows of gravestones, all bathed in the eerie light of the moon. But there, near the edge of the cemetery, I saw it, a small mausoleum, its door slightly ajar. There! I pointed toward it. We can hide in there. Sam didn't argue. We bolted from our hiding spot, running full tilt toward the mausoleum. As we approached, I could hear the faint sound of footsteps again the same deliberate, slow steps from inside the house. But this time, they were coming from behind us. My skin prickled with dread as I realized those cloaked figures were now heading straight for us. We reached the mausoleum, and Sam yanked the door open. The inside was small, just a stone room with shelves for coffins, but it was enough. We hurried inside, closing the heavy door behind us. The darkness enveloped us, thick and suffocating, but I didn't care as long as we were hidden. For a few agonizing minutes, we sat there in silence, listening. The footsteps outside grew louder, closer, until they stopped just beyond the door. I held my breath, feeling my heart hammering in my chest. My mind raced with thoughts of what we had seen, and what those people wanted with us. Then, the door creaked. Slowly, it inched open. Light spilled into the mausoleum and I could see the outline of one of the cloaked figures standing there, blocking the exit. My stomach twisted into knots, and I felt Sam tense beside me. The figure didn't move, just stood there, watching us with unseen eyes. And then, without a word, it stepped back and closed the door. For a moment, we sat there in stunned silence. They had found us, but they didn't take us. Why? I didn't want to stick around to find out. I grabbed Sam's arm, and we slowly pushed the door open again, making sure the coast was clear. The figures were gone. They had retreated, disappearing into the shadows of the night. We need to go, I whispered. Now. Without waiting for a response, we sprinted out of the cemetery and didn't stop running until we were far, far away from that mansion, from the cloaked figures, and from whatever dark ritual we had interrupted. We never spoke about that night again and we never went back to the mansion. I don't know who those people were or what they were doing, but one thing was clear, we were never meant to be there. Whatever they were involved in, it was something much darker than we could ever have imagined. And I'm just glad we got out alive. It was the fall of 2017, my sophomore year at Blackwood University. The leaves had started to turn, blanketing the campus in a sea of yellow and orange, while the air had that crisp bite of approaching winter. The semester had barely begun, and I was knee-deep in the process of pledging for Sigma Theta, one of the most infamous fraternities on campus. It wasn't just the wild parties or the brotherhood that drew me in, it was the promise of belonging, a tight-knit group that could become my family for the next few years. But like anything worth having, the initiation process was no walk in the park. One night Ethan, my closest friend in the fraternity, 
and I got the call. The invitation, as the brothers like to call it. It was our final challenge before we could be accepted into the fold. We were going to visit a place the older brothers referred to as Riverside, an old, decrepit hospital that had been abandoned for decades. No one knew the full history of it, but the rumors were enough to send shivers down anyone's spine. Some said it had been a tuberculosis ward, others swore it was a mental asylum that shut down after a fire in the 70s. Whatever the truth was, the place had been left to rot, its broken windows and collapsing roof the perfect setting for every ghost story imaginable. Ethan and I were to lead a group of about ten other pledges. The older brothers would wait for us back at the house. They made it sound like a simple task, go to the hospital, take some pictures to prove we were there, and leave. Easy right? I remember standing in the park just outside the town, our group huddled together in the dark, staring at the wall of trees ahead of us. The hospital's just on the other side of the woods, Ethan said, shining his flashlight through the dense undergrowth. It'll take us about ten minutes to walk there. The rest of the group exchanged uneasy glances. I won't lie, I felt it too. That gnawing sensation in the pit of my stomach that something wasn't quite right. But peer pressure is a hell of a thing, especially when you're trying to prove yourself. So I shook off the nerves, forced a grin, and led the way into the trees. The woods were eerily silent, the only sounds coming from the crunch of leaves beneath our feet and the occasional snap of a branch as we made our way through. The moon was hidden behind thick clouds, casting everything in a deep, unsettling shade of black. My flashlight bounced off twisted branches and gnarled roots, but it wasn't enough to shake the feeling that we were being watched. It wasn't long before we broke through the trees and found ourselves standing at the edge of the hospital grounds. There it is, Ethan muttered, pointing his light toward the building in the distance. Riverside loomed in front of us, a hulking shadow against the night sky. The place was massive, four stories tall, with shattered windows lining every floor and ivy creeping up the sides of the building like it was trying to swallow it whole. A single street lamp flickered in the parking lot, casting just enough light to make the scene even more surreal. This is messed up. One of the pledges, a guy named Chris, whispered behind me. What if someone's in there? Like squatters or something? Nah, it's been abandoned for years. Ethan reassured him. Nobody's lived here since, well, I don't know when. But it's empty. Despite Ethan's confidence, I couldn't shake the unease that crept up my spine as we approached the building. We reached the entrance, a shattered window just wide enough for us to crawl through, and one by one, we climbed inside. The first thing that hit me was the smell. Stale, musty air filled with the scent of decay. The kind of smell that settles into the walls of a place that's been forgotten. We were standing in what used to be the lobby, I guessed, though it was hard to tell. Everything was covered in a thick layer of dust, and debris littered the floor. Broken chairs, pieces of ceiling, old papers scattered like leaves after a storm. But it wasn't completely empty. The remnants of its past were still there rusted hospital beds, medical equipment long past its prime, even a few four stands still standing in the corners. All right, Ethan said, trying to sound casual. Let's split up. We'll cover more ground that way. I glanced at him, feeling the tightness in my chest grow. You sure that's a good idea? We'll be fine. Just stick to pairs. Take some photos, maybe explore a little, and meet back here in 20 minutes. Easy. Reluctantly, I agreed. Ethan and I paired off, and the rest of the group did the same, scattering into different parts of the hospital. We decided to head upstairs, thinking we'd get some good pictures of the upper floors. As we climbed the crumbling staircase, the air seemed to grow heavier, more oppressive. Every step felt like it echoed through the empty halls, and every creak of the old building made me flinch. By the time we reached the second floor, I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. Something about this place just felt wrong. The hallways stretched out before us, dark and endless, the doors to each room hanging slightly ajar, as if someone, or something, had been here recently. We'll check out this way, Ethan said, gesturing down one of the corridors. Should be quick. We hadn't gone more than a few steps when I saw it, 
just a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye. At first, I thought it was a trick of the light, but then it happened again. A shadow, moving just beyond the door of one of the rooms. Did you see that? I whispered, my voice barely audible. Ethan turned to me, his face pale in the dim light. See what? There's someone here. We both stopped, staring down the hallway. At the far end, just beyond the reach of our flashlights, was a figure. It was hard to tell if it was a man or a woman, but they were standing perfectly still, facing away from us. Ethan, I hissed, my heart pounding in my chest. We need to go. But before he could respond, a scream shattered the silence. It was loud, piercing, like someone was in unimaginable pain. It came from the direction we had just come from. The scream hung in the air, freezing us in place. My blood turned to ice as the sound echoed through the hallways, bouncing off the cracked walls and filling every corner of the hospital with an unnatural terror. It was a woman's scream, high-pitched, guttural, and filled with such agony that it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight. My heart was pounding so loudly that I thought it might burst through my chest. Ethan turned to me, his face drained of all color. What the hell was that? He whispered, his voice shaking. I don't know, but we need to go. Now. Without waiting for his reply, I grabbed his arm and pulled him back toward the stairs. My legs felt like they were made of lead as I forced myself to move, but every fiber of my being was screaming at me to get out of there. Whatever was in this place, it wasn't something we wanted to meet. But as we turned to head back down the hall, we saw it. The figure that had been standing at the end of the hallway, it was gone. Ethan swore under his breath, his flashlight shaking in his hand as he scanned the empty corridor. Where did they go? He muttered his voice barely audible. I don't care. Let's just get the others and get out of here. We bolted down the hallway, our footsteps echoing through the eerie silence. But just as we reached the top of the stairs, we heard it again, another scream. This one was closer, sharper, like it came from right behind us. I turned, shining my light down the hall, but there was nothing there. No figure. No shadow. Just the dark, empty hallway stretching out before us. I felt a cold sweat break out across my forehead. Every instinct I had was screaming at me to run, but my feet seemed rooted to the spot, paralyzed by the creeping dread that had wrapped itself around my chest. Ethan stood beside me, breathing heavily, his eyes wide with fear. Come on, he urged, his voice barely steady. We've got to find the others. We stumbled down the stairs, nearly tripping over each other in our haste to escape whatever horror was lurking in the shadows. As we reached the first floor, we found the others, huddled in a tight group near the broken window we had crawled through earlier. Chris was the first to see us. Did you hear that? He asked, his voice trembling. Someone screaming. Yeah, we heard it, I said breathless. We need to get out of here. But before anyone could move, the temperature in the room seemed to drop. The air grew thick, almost suffocating, and the hairs on my arms stood on end. Then, from somewhere deeper in the hospital, we heard footsteps. Slow, deliberate footsteps, echoing through the halls. They were coming toward us. Who the hell is that? One of the pledges asked, his voice cracking with fear. I don't know, I whispered, my eyes darting around the room. But we're not sticking around to find out. We scrambled toward the window pushing each other out of the way in our desperate attempt to escape. One by one, we crawled through the shattered glass, stumbling out onto the cold grass outside. The air was fresh, but it did little to calm the frantic beating of my heart. As soon as my feet hit the ground, I grabbed Ethan's arm and started running. The others followed, their footsteps pounding against the dirt as we raced through the trees, back toward the safety of the park where we had left our cars. My lungs burned, and every muscle in my body screamed for relief. But the only thing I could think about was getting as far away from that place as possible. We didn't stop running until we reached the parking lot. Gasping for breath, we collapsed against one of the cars, our chests heaving with exhaustion. For a moment, no one said anything. We were too shaken, too terrified to process what had just happened. Finally, Chris broke the silence. 
What the hell was that? He asked, his voice hoarse. Who was in there with us? I don't know, Ethan said, wiping the sweat from his brow. But we're not going back. I nodded in agreement. I saw someone in the hallway. I said quietly, my voice barely above a whisper. Someone was standing at the end of the corridor, just watching us. And then, they disappeared. The group fell silent again, the weight of my words settling over us like a dark cloud. No one wanted to admit it, but we all knew there was something wrong with that place, something that went beyond the usual ghost stories and urban legends. We had all felt it. The oppressive air, the eerie silence, the feeling of being watched. And then, of course, the screams. I don't know what that was. I continued my voice trembling. But whatever it was, it wasn't human. Ethan looked at me, his face pale and drawn. You really think it was a ghost? I don't know, I admitted. But I'm not going back in there to find out. The others murmured their agreement. No one wanted to be the one to challenge the decision. We had seen enough, heard enough, to know that whatever was inside that hospital, it was better left alone. We piled into our cars, eager to put as much distance between us and Riverside as possible. The drive back to campus was tense and silent, each of us lost in our thoughts. I couldn't shake the feeling that we had narrowly escaped something far worse than we could comprehend. As we pulled up to the fraternity house, the older brothers were waiting for us on the porch, beers in hand and grins plastered on their faces. They had no idea what we had just been through. Did you guys make it? One of them asked, smirking. I forced a smile, trying to act casual. Yeah, we made it. But as I looked back at the group, I saw the same haunted expression on everyone's faces. We had made it out, yes, but something had followed us. I could feel it, a lingering presence that clung to me like a shadow. That night, as I lay in bed, I couldn't sleep. Every creak of the house, every whisper of the wind outside, sent a fresh wave of fear coursing through me. I kept hearing that scream, echoing in my mind, and I couldn't shake the image of the figure standing at the end of the hallway. And then, just as I was about to drift off, I heard it again. A scream. From right outside my window. 